This is Real Conversations with Anita, a mental health podcast brought to you by Iltizam by Equinus and Miasa Malaysia. Isn't that the point of life? It is. Having purpose and meaning for all individuals. Yep. And having a reason to live. Yes. Because we know by diagnostic category, if I no longer have purpose and meaning in life, I actually can will myself to death. But don't, right. The first step. I think is to acknowledge that you're not okay dulu. And to acknowledge that you're not okay pun perlu waktu. Hmm, perlu sedikit ilmu, vulnerability and kejujuran sebenarnya. The whole life is a trial. Right? So different people are given different types of trials. That's correct. Yeah? With disability or mental illness, we are given more tests compared to others perhaps. Betul. Yeah? But the higher the test, the higher the return. Betul. Insyaallah. Assalamualaikum and hi everyone. Welcome back to Real Conversations with Anita brought to you by Iltizam by Equinus and Miasa Malaysia. I'm Anita, your host, and as usual today we will be unpacking taboos surrounding mental health and mental health issues. And through our podcast, we also aim to honor the stories, struggles and success of individuals who have gone through such extraordinary experiences and have contributed tremendously within the impact space and Today with us, we are truly humbled and excited to have with us Professor Ahmad Hankir, an award-winning psychiatrist currently working in Ontario, Canada. Welcome, Brother Ahmad. How are you today? Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillah. I'm very well. Thank you. How are you, uh, Sister Anita? I'm good. I'm well. Very excited, very happy and humbled to have you in our show. Thank you so much for being here. So, your second time to Malaysia? This is my second time, yes. Mashallah. So, how do you find it this time around? Magical. Magical. Alhamdulillah. You have a beautiful country and beautiful people. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much. Now, Brother Ahmad and I, for the information of everyone, we met um, physically in 2019. We did. So you were present. We invited you to speak for our conference, the International Mental Health Recovery Conference 2019. And then we met again in UK in 2020. We did. Yes. In, in London. Brought, yeah, uh, in London. And you brought us out at this wonderful restaurant. Alhamdulillah. And Alhamdulillah. then now here you are. Again, four years later in Malaysia, same mission. Yes. However, today with the wonderful news to share with everyone, which is your book, yes. Breakthrough. Now tell us a little bit about it. So by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. MashaAllah. Congratulations, brother. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I published a book, the title of which is Breakthrough, a story of hope, resilience, and mental health recovery. My main aims were to harness the power of storytelling Mashallah. to dignify, empower, and humanize persons living with a mental health condition. Alhamdulillah. And I traced my recovery journey from impoverished, stigmatized, shunned, dehumanized person living with a mental health condition to empowered mental health advocate, survivor, consultant, psychiatrist. Mashallah. So my goal is to spread that message of hope and recovery and to plant the seeds of hope into the hearts, minds, bodies, and souls of persons living with a mental health condition. Which is, mashallah, which is so important because I think hope is something that is so difficult to see, especially mm. when you're in crisis. And yeah. like you said, you know, stigmatized or shunned or ostracized mm. because that is really what happens a lot of times uh, when you're struggling and when you're such in such situations or your environment isn't necessarily supportive of your recovery journey. Because you know this very well. There's still so much stigma when it comes to mental health issues and people living with it. Definitely. Definitely. I mean, we have made progress. We have. Definitely. We have made progress. But there's still plenty more work to be done. And uh, looking forward to your International Stigma Conference in uh, November. Mashallah, alhamdulillah, yes, yes, November 23rd and 24th. Uh, alhamdulillah. So, brother, tell me a little bit more. So, how is the process like um, for you writing this book and what made you, you know, what, or rather what motivated you to write? Well, I think motivation is here, isn't it? And yeah. then, like, kind of inspiration is like, so what, what, in, what inspired me? Mm -hmm. When people ask me this question, yeah. breakthrough, mm -hmm. my book was always in here. 
and then here. But it felt trapped. I know what you mean. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I do. And then I moved to Canada in October, a tale of two Londons, London, UK to London, Ontario. I played istikhara. And we prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify our intentions. Always. And I begged to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if this is better for me and my deen, then make it easy for me. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it easy for me. Alhamdulillah. And then when I arrived, Allah blessed me because I felt inspired to go to the masjid every morning to pray Fajr. And it takes about 90 minutes to walk. Okay. Because I, I don't like to... Nine zero. Nine zero. Yeah, I don't like to drive. That's a long walk. Relatively speaking. You can imagine during the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad when so they had to walk from Yathri, Medina to Mecca right. or from... So that puts things into perspective, doesn't right. it? 90 minutes back and forth? Or no, just one way. Just one way. And Allah inspired me. I felt enlightened. And during that journey, I used my smartphone and it just flowed out of me mm. whilst walking to the masjid and on my way back. So every day I would use my smartphone and I would write my story. Mm. And it took me four to six weeks. Oh, well, that's fast. And I look back at it now. I, I ask myself, how did I do that? I don't right. think I can do that again. Right. <laughs> I mean, because of our beliefs and we are believers. We are. I would say that was divine intervention. And it just, yeah, it just flowed out of me. Yeah. Yes, I'm hoping that it can be a resource. It, it will be. It is a resource, definitely. Of, of hope. Mm -hmm. And that it can be a companion because you know when you're living with a mental health condition, you can right. be di you can be disconnected, Correct. you can be isolated, you can be lonely. And I pray that breakthrough is a companion sure. for persons living with a mental health condition in a mental health crisis, right. and it will make them feel less alone mm -hmm. and less afraid. And so, it will plant the seeds of hope into their hearts, minds, bodies, and souls. I I, I pray thus. Right. So it's a physical book. Do you have it in e ebook? Yes, there is. A oh, Kindle. There is, oh, Kindle. There is okay. a Kindle version, mm -hmm. and we're hoping to get it tran uh, translated awesome. into um, the uh, yes, the main languages sure. here in, in yeah, Malaysia. Bahasa. So hopefully by November. Okay. Um, awesome. It, oh, so it, it we'll have be... it in time for the conference. Inshallah. 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 Yes. Yeah. I'm Bahasa. in discussions with the publisher Wiley. Okay. Awesome. So what was the inspiration? Tell me. The story. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay. So our uh, role model. Right. And Gaza. Mm -hmm. as well Gaza what's as happening well. to our brothers and sisters, sisters and our children in Gaza yeah. and we plan and Allah yeah. subhanahu wa ta'ala plans and he is the best of planners. and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best of planners so it just happened <laughs> yeah I, I uh, awesome yeah alhamdulillah okay so alhamdulillah. tell us where can people get the book they can get the book in uh, Kino Kunia. Kino is that Kunia, right? oh, yes, yeah, Kino. That's the, one so, of the main mm -hmm. bookstores here in KL. Yes, you KLCC. You can get it online. Online, yeah, okay. Directly from Wiley, which okay. is the publisher. Hopefully, we're going to stock up in all the uh, bookstores uh, here okay. in, uh, in Malaysia. Malaysia? Yeah. Okay, awesome. All right, so other than the book, uh, brother, so any other new exciting projects that you're currently involved in? This is how we connected, yep. because we are both passionate about more than reducing stigma. We are passionate about rejecting stigma. Yes. So I now have an interest in brief video interventions because you know how that, mm, that, I see. that okay. window yeah. to intervene is so, it's so narrow, isn't it? Very. This might actually betray my age. So do you know that film with mm -hmm. Tom Cruise, Jerry Maguire? Of course you know I do. One of my favorite mo movies. One of your favorite movies, movies right? And all, all these kind of wives, they gather and right. they are all kind of berating their mm -hmm. husbands and mm -hmm. talking about how much they hate men. And then mm -hmm. Tom Cruise arrives. Let me say the line. Like, please say the line. How does it go? How does it go? You got me at you, hello. You got me at hello. hello. You got me at hello. Yeah. So if you don't get them at hello, you've lost them. Yes, that's right. how narrow the window is to reject stigma. Right. And so that's why now I'm interested in brief video interventions. And by brief, I mean 180 seconds. And there is this fascinating study published in the American Journal of Psychiatry. Okay. Because we know that one of the most stigmatized conditions, it's apart from EUPD, apart from borderline personality disorder, is first episode psychosis. So this was a randomized study, a brief video intervention, 180 mm -hmm. seconds in duration. Okay. The protagonist of which is an African-American woman living with schizophrenia. And they showed 
that it was associated with sustained reductions mm. in stigma. And that's all it took, 180 seconds. And the ingredients, there was emotional engagement because people viewing it were able to relate. So there's engagement and there's identification and there's humanization. And how do we engage? How do we engage the mind? Mm -hmm. By harnessing the power of storytelling. We engage both the mind and the heart. So she shared her story, the protagonist, the African-American woman living with schizophrenia. And there's identification because she was experiencing emotional turmoil. Mm -hmm. like, we don't have to use psychiatric labels. If you don't feel comfortable with psychiatric right, exactly. diagnoses, we don't have to. But we all experience emotional turmoil. Of course. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu experienced did, emotional so turmoil. Yes, he did. There was that identification. And then also the humanization. Because persons living with schizophrenia, for example, mental health conditions are being dehumanized. And by harnessing the power of storytelling, we can humanize persons. And what is this video called? Do you um, recall? I don't know what the video is called, but right. the first name author is someone called Duran Amsalem. And I think he did co-author this paper with Professor Andreas Martin at okay. Yale School of Medicine, who is honest, open and transparent about living with bipolar affective disorder. MashaAllah, alhamdulillah. Yeah. So, okay. so what we're trying to do mm. now is hopefully collaborate with you and yep. colleagues here in Malaysia, develop a brief video intervention, mm. the protagonist of which is a Muslim person living with a mental health condition, because mm. we both know that mental health related stigma is rampant in the Muslim community. It is. So that's what we're trying to do now. MashaAllah, alhamdulillah. That's so brilliant though. We do see a lot of videos being provided, but whether it fits um, the purpose or not, that's also the other thing. So it's it's really nice when you say engagement, identification, and then what's really important is humanization. 100%. Yeah. MashaAllah, alhamdulillah. Okay, cool. Awesome. And then, of course, you're joining us in November for the conference. Yes, yeah, um, super excited. Awesome. Yeah. And it's so wonderful that you're, you know, you're talking again about, you know, storytelling. Because I remember in 2019 when you came, you spoke about storytelling as I well did. and how important it is. And I remember the uh, Lancet Commission came out with their Lancet report on, you know, stigma and discrimination. And one of the things they yeah. spoke about was also storytelling. Yeah, really, really that's good, correct. Good, yeah. Really awesome. I think they also really emphasized, because at the moment it mm -hmm. feels like it's everything about us without us. It is. It but should it, should, be. it should be nothing about us without yeah, us. Yeah, nothing right? about so, us So persons us. living with a mental health condition have to play a leading role in stigma rejection. Everything. Uh, campaigns, for sure. Of course. Yeah. Awesome. Brother, so we want to talk a little bit about your early childhood experiences sure. um, yeah. okay yeah. so you were born in belfast raised in dublin and then england and moved to lebanon at the age of 12 I and did. then you moved back to, back to england when england. i was 17 yeah okay, awesome. yeah by myself by yourself okay. well, with my twin brother but right. my parents remained in lebanon right oh yeah and then also the other thing uh, i think a lot of people don't know you're twins as well yes and, and where is your brother currently at the moment he's in zurich He's in Zurich. Mm -hmm. So oh, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Do you know that wonder drug, Ozempic? Yeah. Yeah. So he is working for Novartis and mm. he's trying to unravel the underlying mechanism. How does this work? Because we know that it's associated with weight loss. Mm -hmm. So my twin brother is conducting research on the, mele on the molecular uh, mechanism of Ozempic. But he's moving to um, Trinity in Dublin in uh, October, inshallah. Marshall, so yeah. you guys are moving around. I, I must share this with you. I'm very close with my twin brother. Yeah. And I'm very proud of him, mashallah. He's a genius. They were interviewing him. Mm -hmm. And we, were, we love Ireland, don't we? Right. Thank, thank God for Ireland. Right. Because they have been very vocal about... They have been. Uh, ...condemning... Big shout any, out. Yeah, big, big yeah. shout out to <laughs> Ireland. And I, I was actually yes. tempted. There was like an Irish pub here in KL. Right. I was so tempted just to to storm into the pub and say, right. free Palestine! <laughs> Maybe I will actually, because I, right. I don't think I'll get a negative reaction. So he was being interviewed. Mm -hmm. And they said, why Ireland? Because we used to live in Ireland. He looks them in the eyes. He's like, you're asking me why Ireland? Mm -hmm. I'll tell you why Ireland. Right. Because when I used to live in Ireland, nobody called me Paki. Mm -hmm. And he silenced them all. Wow. No racism when we lived in Ireland. We didn't even know that the complexion of our skin wasn't white. I only discovered that I was not white, when I moved to England. So I thought I would just share that with you all because no, we know that racial trauma is real. It is real. Right? Racial Extremely trauma is real. Good. And racism, Malaysia is not exempt, mm -hmm. right? Country. Malaysia is no exception. Right, right. You know? So, mm -hmm. yeah. MashaAllah. So I often quote my mother mm -hmm. and she continues to say, moving to Belfast from Beirut mm -hmm. in the 80s mm -hmm. was like jumping out of, out of the frying pan mm -hmm. and into the fire. Okay. Because there was... A conflict raging yes. in During Lebanon the time. at the time. Yes. There was also a conflict raging in Belfast in the 80s. Mm -hmm. was one of the most dangerous cities in the world. So, because we had the troubles. Right. 
And my mother said the difference between the IRA mm -hmm. and the Israeli occupation forces right. is that the IRA would at least give you that courtesy call mm -hmm. and say in 30 minutes we're, we're yeah. bombing that building. Move out now, right? Yeah. But in the 80s, yeah. we didn't receive we didn't that have... courtesy call from the Israeli right. occupation forces. Right. So we didn't know. You, know. you could never know, right? No, you didn't know. You yeah, didn't know you that, didn't no. Know. And memories of those dark days, you know, Sabah and Shatila, mm -hmm. the atrocities mm -hmm. that occurred in the refugee camps in Beirut. Memories of those dark days, you know, we talk about intergenerational trauma, right. right? Those memories haven't faded and they continue to influence our mental health. But I don't remember Belfast. I was okay. born in Belfast. I okay. don't remember Belfast. I remember Dublin because my, my parents moved from Belfast to Dublin. Dublin. And I have very fond memories. I just remember people being so friendly. I appreciate that the lens that you see the world through mm -hmm. when you're a child right. is not the same lens that you see Very the world different. through when you grow up. Right. But, but the point I'm making is I had a happy childhood in, in, in Dublin. Alhamdulillah. Yes. And then we moved to England and that was when we started to feel the racism. Basically. And it was like, it was relentless. It was like almost every day getting into scraps, into fights. Mm -hmm. I have an aversion to violence. So right. this was self-defense. And yeah, I lost count. I lost count how many wow. fights that we got into. Yeah, so it's but you unfortunate. But you spoke yeah. English though, right? No, we spoke English. Yeah. And, uh, you know, very much at the time, right. identified as British. Right, exactly. But we weren't treated as British. So we mm -hmm. only lived like in Leeds for like a year. Then we moved to this place called Worcester. Because looking at you, you could just blend in, you know what I mean? You would think so. Yeah. You would think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, I don't know. I guess I'm not. <laughs> not white I'm enough. Not, yeah, I'm not white enough, I okay. guess. Even my name, you know, Ahmed. That's true. I forgot about the you name. Know, I'm unapologetically right. Muslim. Right. I'm proud to proud, be Proud, of course. You know, and mm -hmm. I shout it from the rooftops, you right. know, even though Islamophobia, you know, is a growing problem in the global north. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't deter me. That doesn't discourage me from vocalizing how proud I am. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And then you went to Lebanon. My mom was getting really homesick. Okay. Um, which is understandable. Right, of course. Right? So we moved to Lebanon mm -hmm. from 95 until 2000. And this was during the aftermath of the conflict. You know, right. we didn't have 24 hour electricity. I remember the searing heat, the mosquitoes, but not being able to speak Arabic and feeling so vulnerable. Ah, and got it. So, you know, in England, like, they would call us Paki. Right. As I said. Right. So you're not one of us. Right. And then you go to Lebanon and they call you Ajnabi, which is the foreigner. You're not awesome. Lebanese either. We all long to belong, mm -hmm. right? We all long to belong, of course. right? Where is my tribe? You can have this identity crisis, mm -hmm. right? Which can render you vulnerable to developing mental health difficulties. Definitely. I think that's what happened. I'll say this, we experienced, like many other families, we experienced poverty. But despite the difficulties, it was, I would say, some of the happiest memories of my life. Because that was before the devastating fragmentation of the family. And so I had to leave my family when I was 17, because the situation back then in Lebanon was terrible. I mean, the situation in Lebanon now is terrible. We all right. know about the blast in the port in Beirut, which is, I think, the largest non-nuclear explosion in history, right. which decimated the, the economy. Prospects weren't looking too good. I was born in Belfast and I had a British passport. Mm -hmm. That's a blessing. And right. just go back to England. You know, money grows on trees over there, yeah. right? You'll be just fine. So it was a family decision then? I mean, I was 17. I was very much ah, beholden. Okay. I was beholden to my parents. My parents said, this is what you should do. And that's what happened. So you and your twin brother? Me and my twin. We packed our bags. At 17? At 17 went... years old. We were just kids. Right. By definition. Right. Legally, we were children. Right. And... We arrived in England, I'll never forget the date, 10th of July 2000, I'll never forget that date, with high hopes for a better future. And then what happened? Lebanon, I graduated top of my class. Naively, perhaps, we expected that we would just waltz into university, you know, and that we would be embraced with arms wide open. Which didn't happen. Which No, which didn't happen. They didn't recognize the qualification. And not only that, we slipped through the cracks. It doesn't matter if you're British. If you don't live in... England for three years. If you don't have something called residency, you are considered an international student at university. The tuition fees are exorbitant. Mm -hmm. So we were just told, we're going to set you back three years because you have to do two years A-levels. Right. And you have to take a year out to be a resident. Right. So just like that. So usually mm -hmm. when you're 17, 18, you go into university. Correct. That didn't happen with me and my family. Okay. And I'm still, I'm still processing that. Okay. You know, I've never had a discussion with my parents, for example, about... Mm. You know, that's never been validated. That was avoidable. Mm -hmm. But then, so my first job was working in a van, selling burgers and kebabs for a living. Okay, so you went straight to work. So, well, I had no choice. You, because you didn't have the money. And I was 17, didn't have any money. Right. And we were considered unskilled. Right. You know, you're an unskilled 
even though we were British, we were treated as if we were immigrants. And that was traumatic. I still get flashbacks. I'm still processing that almost wow. two decades ago. It happened. So did you have a roof on top of your head? During Alhamdulillah, there was, there was a roof on top of my head. You see, these right. are things that you can't take for granted. Right. I wouldn't say it was secure. Mm -hmm. I would say that I experienced accommodation and security. But there was a roof over my head. But I was earning, it was like a minimum wage. Right, right. But I had job security. To, what to, what to, was to, minimum wage like during Like at the time, it was like four pounds an hour. Right, which is like, okay. you, know, you hardly make ends meet mm. with four pounds per hour. Right. But you see the forlorn expressions on the faces of fathers because every father has that impulse. It's in a, in a father's nature yeah. to want to provide and to protect. Definitely. Call me traditional. It's not. But, you know, every father has, it's in his nature to want to provide and protect for his family. Yes. And you see that forlorn expression on the faces of the fathers in Lebanon mm -hmm. who were unemployed and who were experiencing, experiencing poverty. Whereas in the UK, it wasn't difficult for me to get a job, even though it was minimum wage. Right. I thought I hit the jackpot. Right. <laughs> yeah, I did. I thought I hit the jackpot because okay. I've seen desperation. Right. So four pounds was luxury. Yeah, relatively speaking. Right. But then when you stay in England for so long, then you, then start, to, right. you start to complain like everyone else because people right. just want to complain and complain and complain. And it's like, we have so much to be grateful for. We have yes. universal health care. That's like unheard of. Oh my right. God, people are dying of treatable Diseases, conditions right? yeah. in Lebanon. And here we have universal health care. Right. And you can't take that for granted. So I'm not very popular, right? Because everyone wants to complain. But I don't want to complain. I want to be grateful. I know that here right. in the UK, education is a birthright. Can't I just be grateful for that? Yeah. So alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. No, it was difficult. Don't get me yeah, wrong. Yeah, I had to yeah. take a year out. Mm -hmm. I was working in this van, selling burgers and kebabs for a living, and then yeah, having to work in a supermarket, stacking shelves, filling fridges, mm -hmm. having to clean floors as well as a janitor, saying good morning to people. Yeah, because you're so naive. Seventeen years old. I didn't think that class and race mattered. Yeah, right. But class and race do matter. There's a reason why people don't want to say good morning to the janitor who might be I don't know. Same skin complexion as me, but now, alhamdulillah, I mean, even though I'm a consultant psychiatrist, even, even though uh, I received an award from the World Health Organization, I always say good morning to people. Doesn't matter what their background is. You're absolutely right. Because you know, we're all fellow alhamdulillah. human beings. Okay, so I know that wasn't easy, everything that you went through. Now, when did your struggles with mental health, did it start when you were in Lebanon? It fluctuates, you know, it, yeah. flu it fluctuates. Because so, it's, it's a lot of things, right? But, I mean, think about it. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we use the Ds, don't we? Is it the three mm -hmm. Ds, like distress, dysfunction, and danger, mm -hmm. right? And so when the, you notice any kind of psychological distress or any impairment in your functioning, mm -hmm. and that can be occupational functioning, yep. that can be academic functioning, that can be social functioning. And then also there's denial as well, isn't mm -hmm. there? But in my book, I talk about the inside switch because denial is a defense mechanism. The mind mounts these defense mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And the inside switch just suddenly turned on mm -hmm. when I was living in Moss Side, which is arguably the the roughest area district in Manchester. So mm -hmm. I, I'm a die-hard Manchester United supporter. I went to medical school in Manchester. And I woke up one morning. I was forced to enter a medical school. And I was staying in this kind of dilapidated, squalid terrace house, right. which was conducive of mental illness, mental everything, disorder, all sorts. Yeah. And I don't care if this shatters my masculine bravado because we need to rewrite the narrative of what it means to be a strong person and expressing our emotions and seeking help. These yes. are signs of strength, not signs of weakness, irrespective of your gender. Being I, vulnerable. Being vulnerable. So I'll embrace my vulnerability. Yes. I cried inconsolably because I was in denial for so long, but then the insight switch suddenly turned on and mm -hmm. you regard the conflagration in your wake. Mm -hmm. Because whilst the bridges in Lebanon were burning Literally, yeah. I was burning bridges in the metaphorical sense with people who I thought were my closest companions at the time. So mm -hmm. initially, I perceived it as a, I framed it as a breakdown. But then you, you use the power of reframing and you breathe meaning mm -hmm. because meaning making is important. Well, you know, why did that happen? And I reframed it as a breakthrough. And why was it a breakthrough? You have Facebook. I think Facebook is popular here in Malaysia, right? Are all your friends on Facebook your friends? No. What's a friend? You have a breakthrough moment and you discover what a friend is. Why am I treating someone a priority who only treats me as an option? So that was my breakthrough. I see. And that, okay. that's what rendered me vulnerable because mm -hmm. I was treating these people like they were my friends, but they weren't. But also, you have to be honest with yourself. Right. People are treating me like I'm their friends, but am I... Really? 
am I treating them as if True. they are my friends? So you have to be honest with yourself because, yeah. as I said, the denial is a kind of is a defense mechanism. Mm. So, you know, alhamdulillah, that was one of the many uh, breakthroughs that I experienced. Mm. Yeah. Denial is one, though, but I do also find, especially in the work that we do, brother, that it's not just denial. It's about having poor insights. You're right. So mm. having poor insight, which can be characteristic of a mental health condition. And then that's when I had the insight. Mm. Because you look at all the damage that was done, right. which is seemingly beyond repair. And mm. that's when you hit rock bottom. It was the loneliest, most afraid and isolated I have ever felt in my entire life. Let's talk about taboo topics, right? right. A taboo topic in the Muslim community is suicide. But I understand it's not so taboo in Malaysia anymore. It's becoming uh, less taboo. Yeah, or... less taboo. And I felt suicidal. <gasps> How dare you? Mm-hmm. Astaghfirullah. Right. Astaghfirullah. Yeah, go okay, pray. so let me let me yeah go pray. Go <laughs> yeah, read, the uh, read some read some yeah. more Quran. Okay, so what if I said to you that you have hay fever mm-hmm. and you go to a field and mm-hmm. you immerse your, yourself in pollen mm-hmm. and I said to you, okay, don't have it on your nose. Right. You okay. can't. That's nonsense. Yeah. Absurd. Suicidal thinking, ideation, mm-hmm. behaviors. Mm-hmm. This is a, a symptom of major depressive disorder. It is. So in the same way that you wouldn't say to someone, don't have it on your nose someone who has hay fever, if you go right. to, you know, a yeah, field with all, the, po- all, with all the pollen there, yeah. then you, you shouldn't say to someone who has major depressive disorder, oh, you shouldn't have suicidal thinking. That's now, right. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil mm-hmm. Alameen, because in Islam, suicide is forbidden, it deters you from acting upon that seductive suicidal impulse, mm-hmm. which is what happened with me. Mm-hmm. I had the ideas, mm-hmm. but I didn't act upon the impulses right. because mm-hmm. Islam is a protective factor. Right. Alhamdulillah. You know that was a lot that you just shared and we truly appreciate it, brother. I think listening to your story and now looking at you, not only now you, you know, you wrote your book, but you're also a psychiatrist and we would like to hear that part of your journey as well. Sure. When we take a break and we'll come right back. Yep. Sounds good to me. Okay. So we are with Professor Alman Hankir in Real Conversations with Anita. We will be right back after this. I know you you spoke about um, your motivation, what motivated you. What about hope, Dr. Nizam? How do you, or how did you find hope amidst these challenges that you were facing? And who was your support mm. system during that time? Your parents, your siblings? Tapi ada ke? Other, maybe external? Uh, Definition of halluc- hallucination, specifically seeing things that are not there or not real, not real to everyone else, real to the person who is seeing the things, um, listening or, or hearing things, or maybe um, smelling things that are not real as well. And also, like you said, maybe more disorganized speech, uh, dis- disorganized uh, in terms of their thoughts as well. Made you realize during, um, at that point that you needed Miasa to come in to help out in terms of you know providing um, health assessments, medication, and all sorts of things. Because I remember during the first time when we were there, it was upon that visit was when we realized, and especially as well during 2020 when we did the Save the Homeless project. Still needs a lot of um, understanding, uh, knowledge transfer, so on and so forth. Now, I just wanted to pull that thread. You know what you just said mm-hmm. earlier on within workplaces, right? I do feel that the reason why we're not progressing much is always when the employers lack the knowledge on mental health. Yeah. Right. Now, so, with Lokman, yeah. from your own lens, right, caring for him, yeah. what do you think are the greatest change that you see? And do you, how does he see it? Do you know? This is Real Conversations with Anita, a mental health podcast brought to you by Iltizam by Equinus and Miasa Malaysia. Great. So, we're, uh, brother, we want to talk a little bit about, you know, you mentioned about storytelling. I did. Yeah. So, when did you or how did you finally decide, you know, I want to share my story? <laughs> did, you, did you carry some shame in you in the beginning? Oh, definitely. Only, definitely. Oh, right? yeah. No, okay. I did. Right. Absolutely. Because you're so open about it. I didn't know if it happened right from the start or, you know, or you carried some shame. And then how did that break? So initially there was a lot of shame. Mm-hmm. And I think my cultural background influenced yeah. that. Definitely. And the term, the Arabic term for mm-hmm. crazy, right? It's right? majnoon. Majnoon. Right, yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, it's heavily stigmatized, yeah. isn't it? Mm-hmm. But I don't think it took me too long to overcome that shame. Oh there, there, there was, alhamdulillah, I mean, there was this event 
in Manchester. Yeah. The it was at the International Anthony Burgess Foundation, and Anthony Burgess, I think, he wrote the book, which became a film called A Clockwork Orange. Don't know that one. So it's an old, it's an old film. Okay. And he's from Manchester, and so there was a stage there, mm-hmm. and it just came out of me this kind of improvisation, you know, right. this kind of theatrical performance. Right. And in that performance, I signposted my recovery journey, and I lost count how many people approached me afterwards, and I thought this might have potential. Mm. Now, it took, I think, several years until I was invited again, because back then I didn't have the same influence that I do now. Mm-hmm. Alhamdulillah. Mm-hmm. Al-Alim. Mm-hmm. So this was way before the wounded. This is, wa- this is way before. Okay. Yeah, there was like maybe like, I don't, I don't know, like a snippet or like, a, you know, a glimpse of, of the wounded healer at the International Anthony Burdesh Foundation. Okay. And then I was at the International conference for mental health at Cambridge University and there was an oral presentation competition and I felt inspired and I had a case report published in the BMJ and I got the first prize for that. Mashallah. I was like wow so I think this has a lot of potential. Oh yeah for winning first place. Yeah yeah I'm good at that. <laughs> and then I actually took time out of my training mm-hmm. my residency it took three years out to deliver the Wounded Healer presentation to audiences nationally and, and internationally. And, yeah, there is sharing. There is, I, I, I reveal yeah. that I'm living with a mental health condition. And, of course, that's absolutely nothing to be ashamed about. Really so, so yeah, so initially there was some shame, but Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, it didn't take me too long to overcome that shame. Oh, Alhamdulillah, that's so good. Now, then you became a psychiatrist. So... I discovered how utterly beholden Mm -hmm. we are to the power and mercy of our minds Mm -hmm. when I was in a mental health crisis. Yeah. And it was a psychiatrist who contributed to my recovery. Okay. And I always wanted to help people. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, you know, what an opportunity to help people. I would certainly say that my perception of psychiatry then is very different to my perception of psychiatry now okay so call me call me romantic Mm -hmm. call me a dreamer Mm -hmm. but that was one of the main reasons why i decided to specialize in psychiatry but it it has been a bumpy ride there has been plenty of turbulence because i don't think i'm your conventional are you both though am i are you both are do you feel like you're both like you're a psychiatrist and you're also a person with lived experience or is it is it distinct i mean how how is it really it's interesting because i was interviewed mm-hmm. by a person in belfast mm-hmm. and this was soon after i became a consultant psychiatrist right and he said you know you have a new tribe now mm-hmm. That's what he said. That's right. not what I was thinking. Because it's too. <laughs> That's not what I was feeling. No, but no, but the psychiatrists, yeah. many psychiatrists. I wouldn't say all of them. No, of course no, not. No, no, of course but, not. You know, I don't feel accepted by. No, I don't feel accepted by the psychiatric profession. Okay. I don't. Not not by other psychiatrists. Mm-hmm. And actually, some of the most vitriolic attacks mm-hmm. have come from fellow psychiatrists. Mm-hmm. And if I wasn't more resilient, mm-hmm. one of them was actually a suicide prevention lead who was making me feel suicidal. Yeah, yeah. And then they were gaslighting me as well. Right. Because they were saying, I'm just providing you with constructive criticism. And this was when you were already a psychiatrist? This was when I was a specialist registrar. Yeah, so I was a higher trainee. Mm. And thankfully, a good friend of mine who is a consultant psychiatrist called me Mm -hmm. because this was happening online. Right. And if he didn't call me and intervene things could have turned out very differently because right. it was so distressing. So oh, it was so bad. Right. So... And this was in the UK. This was in the UK, okay. in, in, in London, in the right. UK. Yeah. And just thinking about it now kind of makes me, makes me uh, right. tremble. Are you um, okay to talk about it? No, no, yeah, no, it's okay. fine. We need to talk about it. Yes, yes, we do. We need to talk about it mm-hmm. because we live in a world that protects the perpetrator and punishes the victim. You know, I can't even say their names now. Right. Because I'm afraid that, right. you know, I, I will be punished. <laughs> 
So do I identify as a, I mean, I am a psychiatrist. Yes, I'm a consultant are. psychiatrist. Right. I'm hoping to try to improve the perception mm-hmm. of psychiatrists. Which is so awesome because now you can do it within because you're inside. Yeah, I'm inside now. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah absolutely. Yeah. You know, so I'm, I'm privileged. I had to yes. earn that privilege. Right. You know, I wasn't born with a silver spoon <laughs> in my mouth. You know, I had to, right. I, had to I had to fight. Right. And, you know, the opening quotes from my book is from Dylan Thomas. Do not go gentle into that good night, but rage, rage against the dying of the light. So many people have tried to sabotage me. So many people have tried to derail me. Mm-hmm. But I'm not going to go down without a fight. Right. You know, I've worked too hard. Right. You know, it's the system, the, the racism, the structural discrimination and stigma. Yeah. I'm not going to go down without a fight. Yeah. So Alhamdulillah, I'm actually in the system now. Right. And there are examples of good practice mm-hmm. but there's plenty of room for improvement oh plenty so, so yeah so i don't really i mean although we coined this mnemonic me and andreas martin mm-hmm. my hermano from mm-hmm. mexico at yale appe I, I think it's helpful so you know expert by personal and professional experience oh, yeah, definitely. if you're a person living with a mental health condition you're an expert by personal experience and if you're a consultant psychiatrist you can be regarded as a, an expert by professional experience yes. So we coined this mnemonic, E-P-P-E, if, if you're a consultant psychiatrist living with a mental health condition. Oh, so um, okay, but I'll right. tell you something. When I'm working at St. Thomas Hospital at 2 o'clock in the morning in Westminster in central London, and I get called out by the psychiatric liaison nurse who says to me that London ambulance services have just been in a mental health crisis. Can you come and see them? Mm-hmm. I don't draw on my professional expertise. I draw on my personal expertise. So I've been criticized for this before, but I'll say it. It won't be the title of my book because I think this is a title of a book. Anxiety is my superpower. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say that's the title of a future upcoming book. But I will say that living with a mental health condition can, in a way, be a superpower. It is. Because I feel like it makes me more empathetic. Mm-hmm. And it makes me more insightful. And it makes me more driven. So I identify more as a survivor. And I remember the Crazy Wise conference in the Netherlands, in, in Holland, yeah. in Amsterdam. It was organized, even with Miyasi here, right? Yeah. Back in 2019. Correct. And I just feel like I can connect more with persons living with a mental health condition right. than I can with uh, okay. psychiatrists. So I identify, firstly, as a person living with a mental health condition, as a survivor, mm-hmm. as a mental health advocate. But uh, yeah, I am a consultant psychiatrist. And I'm actually in a unique position where I can advocate Right. Uh, for for do you, persons that do you tell people condition. that like when you're helping a client out do you tell them you're a person I, I mean I do a lot more listening okay than I do talking it's interesting because in the mm-hmm. UK there's I think Dr John Lovell he was at York University mm-hmm. he actually did his PhD on sharing right because you it's not like the 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 body that governs physicians in the UK it's a general medical council Okay. And we have the Royal College of Psychiatrists, which regulates psychiatrists. There's mm-hmm. nothing to stop you. It's not prohibited. Mm-hmm. There's nothing to stop you from sharing. Right. A lot of people think, oh, we shouldn't do this. It's unethical. Right. Or, you know, the GMCU, the Royal College of Psychiatrists, they'll, right. they'll, uh, we'll get into trouble with them. No, there's, mm. there's nothing to stop you from doing that. Okay. So his PhD was fascinating. I was reading his thesis. The one thing that patients want to know the most about because there are, you can share right. different, you know, you can you can share about different things, what your hobbies are, what your interests are, you know, things like that. The one thing that patients want to know the most about is if a psychiatrist is living with a mental health condition or not. Correct. Right. That's what the data indicates. But you know what? The one thing that psychiatrists are least likely to share mm-hmm. is that they're there. living with a mental health condition. Correct. So I thought that was really interesting that the the findings of his uh, of his PhD. Right, but it's really helpful though, um, because the moment someone knows the person that you're supporting knows that you live with a mental health condition, then you can connect better. I, I think you can, but also mm. you know we have to be careful because mm. it's it's the it's subjective, isn't it? Right. It so is. I mean, there's some universality because I think we all know to an extent what it's like to be hopeless right and what it's like to succumb to despair Mm -hmm. and what it feels like to be powerless right and what it feels like to be stigmatized right so there maybe is some universality in 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 that way but you know living with a mental health condition for you is different is different than it is for me so i think just being mindful of that right um see one of the things that if i may share real quickly is because we were trained in in what's called intentional intentional peer support so in intentional peer support we say relate to connect 
And this has really changed the way I see how we support a person who is in distress because a lot of times we think, okay, it's about the person. So you don't want to get, you don't want to put yourself in the middle, right? But really when you say things, that's a very good point that you mentioned, brother. So one of the things that we say is, I too live with depression. As an example, the way I understand depression is this way. How do you understand yeah, depression? Exactly. So that that's the way you relate to connect. Yeah, hundred percent. Right. 100%, right? Yeah, 100%, so yeah. coming to that point that you just mentioned, right? Because you don't want to minimize that person's pain and struggle, and you also do not want to generalize that what that person is going through is exactly like what you're going through as well. Exactly. Right. I mean, minimize, generalize. Yeah. Most importantly, you don't want to invalidate. Invalidate definitely. Yeah, because I mean, there can be little to no healing without exactly. validation. Exactly. So and true. I always share this quote, yeah. saying to someone that they shouldn't be depressed because other people have it worse. Yeah. It's like saying to someone they shouldn't be happy because other people have it better. Right. Right. So, you know, we have to be extremely careful never to very, invalidate very a person's distress. And, you know, it's so interesting when you say the word either, you know, validation or validating, because I remember there was this one time that I was in such a bad shape that this one person came to me and the only thing she said to me, brother, was, Anita, what you're going through is valid. And I didn't know. And the way it hit me during the time, brother, was it was so powerful. It really is powerful. Yeah. It's, you know, because you, you throw the word so much, right? You say it so much, like validate, validate. But until you experience it yourself, and people think it's rocket science, you've got to say this and that. But really just saying that word valid in itself, that's powerful. It is, it is. And like you said, mm -hmm. saying validate or what you're going through yeah. is valid but i mean there are other ways of validation isn't exactly, there like, i mean exactly. like even just saying even though i mean i, I sometimes i say it you just say you know, with, with sincerity like you know i'm so sorry yeah you know, i'm so sorry that you went through that right. you know it, if that was real for you right um and showing that kind of empathy i think that, right. that can go a long way what you're going through is a lot or i don't understand it can you yeah I, I, i've never been in that situation yeah, before exactly i don't know right yeah and that humbles me you know, and that's what we need. We need more humility. We do. And even to this day, the best psychiatrist I've ever met is, he's not even a psychiatrist. He's a consultant mm -hmm. surgeon. He endorsed my book, Professor Jed Byrne. Okay. And I'll remember the humility. Like, he doesn't know what it's like to wake up one morning to discover that your hometown has been bombed. Right. He's like, he's like I don't know what that's like. Right. You know, and we need that. We need more humility. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of humility in <laughs> medicine, certainly not in psychiatry. <laughs> right. I think it's so, I mean, a lot of times we we tend to wear that rescue ahead. So we want to provide solutions, solutions, solutions without acknowledging that, you know, maybe I don't know. It's more than just that. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'll just say it. This yeah. might be this might be controversial. It might be provocative. Mm. But there's also the whole white savior complex as well. You know, um, that's the kind of colonial mindset. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I've, I've experienced a lot of that mm -hmm. for sure. Interesting. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ahmad Hanker will be right back in segment three where we'll talk a little bit about your personal message and maybe your hopes moving forward yeah. and your hopes for the book as well. Yeah. Okay. So, folks, we are with Professor Ahmad Hanker, a award-winning psychiatrist who is now based in Canada, but he is now right here in our studio in Real Conversations with Anita. We'll be right back after this.
you know, brother, with everything that we're seeing uh, happening in our world today and what you have experienced, what are your thoughts on what can we do better collectively as a global society to improve things, like you said, to humanize the current situation and, you know, mental health challenges, people living with mental health conditions, what can we do more of? My immediate thoughts are to have an open mind and to have an open heart and to be less defensive and more receptive and also to be honest with yourself, to be brutally honest with yourself. Yeah. Are you perpetuating mental health related stigma Mm -hmm. or are you going to contribute to our cultural revolution that empowers and dignifies and humanizes persons living with a mental health condition. Mm-hmm. So I think it's, we need to be better at listening, but also we need to be careful with how we communicate. And that's both verbal communication, the words mm-hmm. that we use, right. which can be deeply stigmatizing. Yeah. It's also nonverbal yeah. uh, communication as well. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, you can make a difference, yeah. you know, by, by reaching out to other people and just by letting them know that you are there, that you are present, Mm -hmm. and making them feel like they are close to you. Because we know that social distance um, is a metric of stigma, isn't it? So don't make them feel like you are running away from them. No, but that you are there for them. I mean, I, I always pay tribute to my dear friend Richard Taylor, I love that man. I haven't seen him for such a long time. Mm -hmm. And when I was experiencing a mental health condition and everyone was stigmatizing me and running away from me, he was running towards me. And you know that quote, sometimes we build these walls not to keep people out, but to discover who has the will to climb over them, right? And he, he just, he refused to be pushed away. And I remember, I'll never forget, he came knocking on my, banging on my door one day mm-hmm. because I wasn't responding to my phone call. I mean, how blessed am I, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, wouldn't the world be a better place if there were more Richard Taylors? And he insisted that he would, um, that he would take me to the family doctor. Yeah. So, and I remember that journey. I, he would, I would, it was just that there was like this verbal outpouring and I would stop and I would look at him and I would try to prompt him to respond. But being the being the inspirational individual that he is, he knew that one of the biggest problems with human communication is that we don't listen with the intention to understand, we listen with the intention to respond. And he just refused to respond. He just, he just, he remained silent. Mm. And yeah, and that was the starting point for my wow. recovery. Yeah. So I think we need to make ourselves more emotionally available yeah. as well. That's so true. I mean... I think we don't know how though. It's not easy. Yeah, it's not easy. It's not easy. Um, And Especially men, right? Especially men. Especially Mm -hmm. men. You know, and I've been very vocal about this, you know, this kind of toxic masculinity, you know, that we need to combat. Mm -hmm. Because we know that the male to female suicide ratio is three to one. We do. We know that toxic masculinity is contributing to suicidal behaviors in men and so we need yep. to rewrite the narrative right. on what it means to be a strong man right. and expressing our emotions mm-hmm. and seeking help to reiterate i know i said right. this before but i'll say it again mm-hmm. these are signs of strength not signs of weakness right. i mean a, lot, a lot's happening in the world at the moment i think you kind of, you, you know you touched upon that yeah we're believers we are and we have to remind ourselves Hunting that we are being tested yeah. and some people are being tested more than others yeah. and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Grant them a victory. I mean, if not soon, the, if not soon, if not in the dunya, certainly in the akhirah. I think we have to remind mm-hmm. ourselves that we we can become so attached to this dunya. Yeah, you know, we know about the we different. Can. We know about the different types of attachment, right? Mm-hmm. Usually, that's in a romantic relationship right. context, and we talk about trauma bond and all of these things. And but we become attached to the dunya, mm-hmm. and we are inspired by the stories of the people in Gaza. We uh, are the. The, their iman, the, their, their faith. iman. You see them, yes, when, and they keep on it. being tested, and they all, and they keep on re- replying with Alhamdulillah, 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 right. and we have to remind because when we see an injustice, yeah. you you hear about this, right? I guess in society, yeah. No justice, no peace. Mm-hmm. You, we, I think many of us are familiar with that. Right. But also, there can be no peace of mind 
if there's no justice in the sense that the perpetrator of the injustice is not held accountable. So there's no peace of mind. Because when we see the perpetrator of domestic violence being mm-hmm. held accountable, mm-hmm. for the victim, that can provide some peace of mind, right? Or or, or closure, maybe the right, right term. Closure, yeah. And so that when we remind ourselves, the perpetrator is evading accountability in the, in the dunya, mm-hmm. but they will certainly not evade accountability in the akhirah. And so that might provide us with some solace, right? maybe. Some peace. Some peace. Yeah. Also, normalize not feeling guilty for temporarily disabling notifications on your social media. Yeah. Because the images that are emerging are horrific, to say the least, from Rafa, from, from Gaza, decapitated babies. It's harrowing. I understand why you might feel conflicted. Because on the one hand, you feel like it's incumbent upon you to remain informed. But yet on the other hand, you feel like it's compromising your uh, mental health. Now, we've been to that dark place before. You're going to make and somehow, me And somehow we emerge, somehow we emerge mm. from that dark place. We both know that we can't go back to that dark place. Right. Um, so we do what we have to to salvage our sanity. Mm-hmm. And if that means temporarily disabling notifications... To, to remain functioning, then that's what we have to do. It's difficult to make sense of it, despite being a believer. I remember Dr. Rania, you know, she said uh, in one of her talks that if you don't understand it, being a believer, you ask and you make dua to Allah. Show me the hikmah, mm. hikmatullah behind mm. it. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, like you said, you can um, you can unmute, you cannot watch it, but it's there, brother. It's there. It's there. It's there. Mm. And I think the knowledge of it being there is, is deeply distressing. Oh, and, and, you know, and you feel, power, you feel powerless. powerless. It's, it's, it's right. not fair. It's not fair. Mm. You know, why, why them and not me? Right. And you can't, it can't even be you because if it's you... I mean, it shouldn't be anyone. Right? Right. It, shouldn't, it be, shouldn't be anyone. Yeah, but I mean, but mm. it, it's almost, it's almost, it feels, almost feels like it's random. Right. Right. Um, but it's not. But it's not, no. Yeah. And as, as, as believers, mm. we must accept this. And we look at what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what he endured yeah. and his companions mm-hmm. and what those before him endured. Look at Fir'aun's wife. Right. True. Look how she was tortured. Mm-hmm. And that will make you cry. How can you not be moved by what she said? Right. And Fir'aun's wife is perplexed. Mm-hmm. Not Fir'aun's wife, sorry. Fir'aun himself is perplexed. I'm torturing you and yet I can see that well, I think the I think she was smiling because her dua was show me my eternal dwelling place right. in the hereafter. Mm-hmm. And when she saw it, when Allah subhanahu right. wa ta'ala gra- uh, accepted her dua, and whilst she was being tortured in the dunya, she was so enlightened, her iman was so high that she could see her dwelling place, her eternal, eternal dwelling place. This is eternal. Yep. So it's difficult for us to remind it because it might feel like it's everlasting, right. this suffering, but it's not. I know. It's finite. Yep. It is. And, and you know, remind yourself what happened when you... The what the hedonists the hedonists they mm-hmm. lived a lifetime of what vice and pleasure, mm-hmm. and in the akhirah they get a glimpse of the punishment that is awaiting them. And you just take a glimpse and you ask them, did you experience any pleasure in your life? They're like, no, there was no joy in my life. Right. And then you live, you show the person who lived a lifetime of misery, mm-hmm. and you show them a glimpse, a bit. just a glimpse. You ask them, was there ever any? Sadness in your life? That no, no, there was no sadness in my mm-hmm. life. And so this is a blessing now, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Alhamdulillah. because we're forgetful. Human beings yep. are forgetful. But here on your podcast, we are reminding ourselves yep. that we are being tested. Some people are being tested more than others, and may, may, their, may their reward be even greater. And may Allah Ameen. subhanahu wa ta'ala accept their prayers. 
and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive them and grant them genital for those, I mean, inshallah. Inshallah, I mean, yeah. I mean, if you look at our brothers and sisters in Palestine, you know where they're going. Mm. We don't know where we're going, brother. We don't. We don't. We don't. And we don't. We don't know what's going to happen. In and the, and the that's why it's such a great lesson for us. Who's, who's, it is. It we're, is. I mean, we're not there. No, we're not there. We're not there. Yeah. No, we have to be but, honest with yourself. Right. Yeah. And so this is the lesson that we should take, like you said, you know, be grateful, do something about it, right? We can. I mean, we yeah. can raise awareness. Yeah. Uh, we can donate to charities. Definitely. Um, you know. Make du'a. We can make du'a. Never underestimate the power of du'a. Definitely. You know, these are all things that we can do. I know that you can mm. feel powerless. Right. And there are people who are protesting. Obviously, we encourage you to protest peacefully. Yeah. There are encampments. Mm -hmm. Look what the students are doing. Look what exactly. the younger people are doing wow. in universities it's throughout the world. Correct. You know. And the boycotting. And the boycotting. Yeah. These yeah. are all Cancel examples. Cancelling. Yeah. Yeah. Things like that. Yeah. Things like that. Alhamdulillah. 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 Thank you, brother, for sharing that. Now, <clears throat> what do you hope your readers will take away from your book, Breakthrough? You know, I was thinking about this yeah. before the break. Mm -hmm. And you've been there, sister Anita. Yeah. Why is it that we suffer in silence? Yep. Why? Why is it that we feel so ashamed? Why is it that we blame ourselves? Why is it that we don't show ourselves the same kind of compassion and love that we would show to our loved ones? Yeah. Why? Why? Why do we do that to ourselves? And so that's my message. I'm hoping that's my message in my book. Mm -hmm. That you don't deserve punishment. You deserve kindness and compassion and treatment. And don't don't suffer in silence. Yeah. I beg you not to suffer in silence. And you see some of these beautiful quotes. You know, it will pass. Yeah. After hardship, there is ease. Choose life. You know, mm -hmm. so I'm hoping that my book will disseminate the message, the messages of hope and recovery. If some, to reach out to as many people as possible. If so. someone is living with a lot of shame and fear at this current moment, right watching now. watching this podcast, brother, yeah. what do you what do you tell them? I mean, we spoke about how the stress is unique and it's subjective, right? But there is some universality because I've been, I know how dark and lonely the world can be. Right. We both know how dark and lonely the world can be. Sure. Don't give up hope. Yeah. You know, and never take hope away from someone because sometimes hope is all they have. Yeah. So I understand that there's a difference between knowing something and feeling something. You know, you might know that most people with a mental health condition can recover, but does it feel that way? Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel that way, does yeah. it? <laughs> right? And so I get it. I get it that to internalize my message, you have to be able to do that both Cognitively with your yeah. mind and emotionally with your heart, and yeah. it takes it. It takes a while for those two oh, to yeah. align and believe you know? in it. Yeah, but the, yeah, but don't mm. give up hope. Yeah, don't because we are we are evidence. You know, you we might are. see a snapshot of us now, and you might think, mm. but you didn't see us back then. No, if you, <laughs> if you said yeah. to us, if you said to us, if you said to us back then, mm. this is where you would be in the future. Right, we would never, we would never, never believe, believe it. You. You're right. Because we have, you know, we've been to that dark and lonely place. So effective Correct. treatment is available. It is. Recovery is a reality. Definitely. Seeking help is a sign of strength, it not is. a sign of weakness. And living with a mental health condition is nothing to be ashamed about. Correct. And don't ever forget that. Inshallah, alhamdulillah. Thank you so much, brother. I think you just wrapped it up. You're welcome. Thank you so much, um, Professor Ahmad Hankir, for sharing all your insights, you know, all your experiences. And now... Um, you know, being uh, not just the person with lived experience, but advocating for this and then writing a book okay. and also contributing, making yourself useful for others, being a psychiatrist. And now within the system and trying your best to change um, the narrative and the perceptions of mental health professionals. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for, you know, um, doing this for all of us. Thank you. And um, well. <laughs> And I hope to read your book soon. Oh, you will? I yeah, and I'll, I'll give you moment, the, the review as well. Yes, please. Yeah, that's really important. <laughs> yeah, yeah, alhamdulillah. Yeah. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Ahmad Hankir, who is a award-winning psychiatrist. He's also a visiting professor at Cardiff University, a consultant psychiatrist in Canada, and obviously the author of his new book, his first book. Uh, my, my first memoir. I have four Four? Psychiatric textbooks. Okay, no. This is different. This, this is, is a, different. Yes, different. Different genre, yeah. Yes, different yeah. genre. Um, this is about your recovery journey as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, absolutely, about hope, resilience, and mental health called The Breakthrough. And you guys can 
purchased this um, online and also in Malaysia currently. It is in Kino Kunia, mashallah, yes. alhamdulillah, and hopefully in more bo- bookstores to come yes, in throughout, Malaysia. Yes, throughout Malaysia. So yeah, and yeah. Uh, Brother Ahmad Hankir will also, Professor Ahmad Hankir will also be joining us for our International Stigma Conference on November 23rd and 24th. There will also be a book signing from him, uh, inshallah, on the 22nd uh, during our press conference as we launch the International Stigma Conference 2024 brought to you by Miasa Malaysia. So that's it, folks. I hope you guys enjoyed it and found it beneficial. If you do, uh, please do share this information across this podcast across because obviously this is will be a beneficial resource for everyone. So take care, everyone. Signing off. Uh, I'm Anita, your host, together with Professor Ahmad Hankir, together in Real Conversations with Anita. Take care, everyone, and please take care of your, Take care of one another. Bye. Bye-bye. This is Real Conversations with Anita, a mental health podcast brought to you by Iltizam by Ikunas and Miasa Malaysia.